So one thing I should say, there is one problem. There was one problem that you should have. You should just turn in next uh, next time with the last homework uh, in chapter seven. Uh, uh, about diffusion. So let's see. So does anybody know about this? Looks like uh, there's a spot 80 miles wide um, of oil happening, and they I think they tried to burn it or something. Yeah, it is the, the uh, oil rig that um, was uh, damaged. And I think this is a kind of a, a prediction of what it will happen. Well, today is already 28, so. Um, okay, we're not going to talk about this complicated uh, process, a much simpler one, but. Um, and then guess what? There is actually another. Um, <laughs> this thing seems to be uh, in the news a lot, right? This is the Icelandic uh, volcano that um, I'm trying to see what the, I was trying to find some uh, kind of in time, um, like a movie or anima animation of, of how it evolved. But it evolved very small and then kind of it spread all, all over, right? I think it even reached the, U.S. Uh, airspace. Um, and again, this is uh, this is quite irregular, right? So that's, and of course, it's quite irregular because the wind patterns are all irregular and, and all that. So, um, but I think the basic concept that's uh, underlying this this type of um, of uh, processes is, is is diffusion diffusion of some some particles in some medium, right? So, um, so we'll, we'll briefly talk about this because it's connected to the central limit theorem, and then uh, we'll move to chapter eight. So, um, these are, by the way, kind of two two totally disjoint um, subjects. So. Um, All right, so let me uh, let me start by uh, by talking a little bit about the diffusion, which uh, simply refers to diffusion of so diffusion. Oops. of small particles of some, say, pollutant um, or chemical um, in um, a medium. And the assumption is that these small particles kind of um, move randomly, so they individually they um, they um, perform what's known a Brownian motion. Okay, a Brownian motion is um, was invented a long time ago, right? So Brown was a I think a biologist in the eight, uh, 1900s, right? Um, that studied I think the Pollen uh, particles, um, and he observed that there is this random uh, fluctuations, and uh, there is, you know, individual particles kind of um, uh, follow a random walk or a random pattern, right? R random positions. The jumps are kind of random, but on ensemble. If you look at the whole, uh, I don't know, pollutant or chemical or pollen, uh, then you start seeing the same kind of um, reoccurrent um, pattern that comes from the central limit theorem. That is, you have a normal distribution. If you start very concentrated at one location, 
then as those particles kind of um, displace or, or you know move randomly in the in the medium, after some time you see some sort of a Gaussian distribution. Um, so a normal distribution. Okay. Then uh, I think later, so this was originated with um, Robert Brown. Um, actually, early in the 19th century. Then uh, Albert Einstein was actually, or Einstein uh, was, um, very very big. Actually, studied a lot of this diffusion of particles and fluids. So again, um, I think he was trying to understand how um, how the fluid, you know, affects the motion of particles, like friction and other things. Uh, so, so the uh, fluid, you know, the f it wasn't like very small particles. It was rather large particles, and he was studying the drag of of those particles in fluids. But uh, the, of course, the. Um, Mathematics started, or the mathematicians started paying attention in the 19th, in the early 20th century, 1923, with uh, Norbert Wiener. Wiener. Okay, so this is kind of an old subject, and it's a it's a very interesting uh, subject in its own. Um, it led basically to discrete models uh, and also to, pro to continuous models. Um, discrete models are, are referred to random walks and of course continuous models would be the diffusion uh, or PDE models. So partial differential equations. Um, and random walks is, is an area of probability. Okay, so I, I don't want to say too much about random walks or discrete models. In this short section, sort of, we just talk about the uh, PDE model, the diffusion equation. Okay. So I guess the only thing to say about the discrete model is, um, in one D, it's a very simple. Um, interpretation of this random walk. So imagine you have a particle that starts at an at a initial time, say at zero, and it moves, so this is the particle, um, it, move, it moves only in discrete, so in discrete moment, you know, at discrete intervals of time, so it, uh, for, um, like after one unit of time, it can move only to uh, designated sites. So these are, let's say, the integers. Zero, one, two, negative one, right, and so forth. So particle position can be um, anywhere in integers. So zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, okay? And um, it moves with, so so it moves. So at each iteration, particle moves uh, with equal probability uh, to the left. So that is equal probability one half to the left side, neighboring side, or right neighboring side. Okay, so you can imagine it moves uh, here with probably one half, or it can move to here with probably one half, and this is at every side. So, one realization of this experiment would 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 follow this particle, right? As it moves, you know, let's say, you know, infinitely, uh, infinite amount of time, up to time t, for instance, let's say. Okay. 
Yeah, it doesn't stay still. It just it always moves either left or right. Um, again, simplest simplest kind of random walk. Um, so the question is, what happens if you if you start with lots of particles, all of them centered at zero? What is going to happen as as that uh, number of uh, as as that um, Of the, as each of those particles is moving, you know, um, do, uh, according to this random walk. So if you have a high concentration, so if at time zero you have a high concentration of particles all at location zero, let's say, right? After time t, Actually, what you're going to see, you're going to see the standard normal distribution. Excuse me. You are seeing normal distribution or Gaussian distribution um, So on a picture, it would be if you have lots of particles, so we're talking about lots of particles and they're all independent of each other. So let's say you have lots of particles stacked on top of each other here, right? Now you let disperse at time t greater than zero. What you're going to see is you're going to see a <coughs> well, in the limit, if if you were to have infinitely many particles in the limit, you would actually see this. Um, Distribution with mean zero and standard deviation. Uh, I believe square root of t. So the variance would be actually t, and this follows from the central limit theorem. So follows from the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem. Okay. By setting appropriately the um, <coughs> the random variables, right? Um, so x1, xn, right? Um, right. So x1 would be so each x would be the Be what it would be the, the, the uh, either plus one or minus one, right? Each would probably a half, and then the sum x1 through xn would actually measure the, the location of that particle after time t, right? So using the central limit theorem, you can actually bound that uh, location. You can actually say the location is going to be within like two standard deviations. With probably 95 percent, right? So you can kind of fit it into this, into this. Um... Okay. Now, as I said, I want to focus only on continuous um, models, where instead of looking at individual particles, even if there are lots of them. Uh, we're looking at the concentration of the particles. So if we call C of X and T to be the concentration of particles. Which is simply means mass divided by volume. So the mass of the particles in a given volume of, of the medium. Okay, and let's say we still talk about one-dimensional uh, for now. Then what you see is you see the following. So on the x-axis, which would be the medium, right? At time t, you have 
So we want to do some sort of a mass balance. We want to we want to look at the amount of material particles or materials. So the mass in an interval, in an infinitesimal interval, x and x plus delta x. So a small region of that medium at a time t and at a, at a subsequent time t plus delta t. Okay? So So if you think about uh, particles possibly leaving this this uh, this region, right? So we're going to focus on this region, and now we're going to say, you know, it's possible that particles are moving away to the left or to the right um, at some rate. Okay, so we're going to call the note q of x to be the rate at which particles or the mass mass of the of the pollutant or chemical or whatever it is uh, the rate at which particles pass uh, location x moving uh, to the right so, so really it should be, I mean that's just a convention, right? So should be moving to the right. So here I, I really want to put minus q, right? So if it's moving to the left, we're going to say the rate at which it's moving to the left is minus q. Okay? And, uh, and then when you do the, uh, the, 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 okay, so now, now if you do this, um, Balance or, or conservation of of, of number of uh, of particles. So the conservation of mass basically says um, the. The concentration at the new time delta t equals the concentration at the old time. So think about this as um, well, maybe concentration times. I should say this: concentration times the length would be the mass, right? So this is mass. This is the mass that's in that medium portion of the medium at time t plus delta t okay and we say that this this mass is the mass that was at the previous time plus um, or actually minus 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 the mass that actually left the uh, the region through the right boundary right so this is going to be minus What's the mass? It's going to be Q of x plus delta x and t times delta t. So that's the um, mass leaving at right end, right? And then also, it's whatever is moving to the right from the left boundary, which is Q of x and t delta t. Okay, so that's, this is the mass entering at uh, left endpoint. It's just con uh, it's just kind of um, counting the, the mass that is at the next time step. Uh, what is this? So this is the this is the original mass. Okay, so this is the this is the new mass at time t plus delta t. Okay? So here's how we can write this c of x t plus delta t minus c of x t. And I can divide by delta t and delta x. 
So the only thing that's left here is delta t, and then on the other side is minus q of x plus delta x minus q of x t. And here is the only thing left is going to be delta x. Okay. As delta x and delta t go to zero, because remember these are supposed to be continuous models, meaning this um, changes have to be making infinitesimally small. Then you see that you get some partial derivatives, so partial with respect to t of c equals minus partial with respect to x of q. Okay. So this is what's known as a sort of conservation of mass in uh, in this in this simple one-dimensional uh, model of particles moving randomly, right, in and out of this uh, in the, of this region or along along the line along in in one D. Okay. Now on top of this. Uh, law conservation uh, conservation of mass. Uh, there is so-called fixed law, which which says um, that there is a, a, a relation between the the rate at which particles move across a boundary. and the concentration gradient. So that says that the rate uh, at which particles uh, move across um, x from left to right is proportional to the um, concentration gradient. So, and that's written as follows. So Q is, is going to be proportional, and there's going to be a constant of proportionality, which you'll see it's negative, and that's the gradient. Concentration gradient is, is partial of C with respect to X at X and T. So intuitively, this, this simply says that if I have, if at a location I have a low gradient, OK, so the particles are concentrated here, less concentrated here, right? So I have kind of a low uh, derivative is, is small, right? Negative, but small. This means that the particles will actually um, move to the right, right? They'll try to kind of get uniform. So this is this is low concentration uh, gradient. Whereas if it's a high concentration gradient, at a location, then what happens? the rate at which particles will actually move is going to be well accordingly higher, right? So in that sense it's it's um, uh, we say that it's proportional to each other. Um, I do have, uh, well there, there, are, there are a bunch of um, applets I think if I can Show just one of them. So if you have, of course, this is actually now in 2D. But if you see, we see a high concentration. Let's say of of these particles. Then there is sort of a high, um, you know, the rate at which these particles um, cross that point is actually going to be higher than what it is now, right? So this. Now the concentration is kind of low, and again, imagine these are like 
not just uh, 20 or 30 dots, but lots of them, right? Then the concentration is going to be um, the rate at which the flux, what do we say, the flux, Q is going to be pr proportional to the concentration gradient. Okay, so, so these two things, one on top of each other, uh, give you, you see, you can actually plug in uh, the uh, Q into the first equation and you get what's called a PD. D is a constant here. Well, it's not always a constant, but D is called a diffusivity constant. And it, and it may depend on on uh, the medium, on the um, on the pollutants, you know, it can depend on various factors. Uh, and it could be not, it also is possible that it's not constant. But in this, uh, let's just assume to be constant. So what you get is you get partial with respect to TFC, yeah, is minus partial with respect to X of Q, which is minus, minus D over 2, Maybe I should put minus partial with respect to x, minus d over 2 partial with respect to x uh, of c. So what you get is you get the following, assuming that d is constant. The standard diffusion equation Uh, that the concentration actually satisfies. Okay? Concentration satisfies. So this is kind of a, it's one of the most important PD examples, partial differential equations, right? Now, how to solve partial differential equations it actually takes a whole course. Um, even this simple differential equation, uh, PD, uh, can be solved in, in many different, you know, several different ways. Um, so, instead of uh, going through that, and I think the book talks a little bit about uh, using Fourier transform, okay? Um, so if you're familiar with the Fourier transform, you know, it's okay to, I mean, probably you've seen this already. Um, but if you haven't, I don't want to spend too much time um, I'll just say, you know, I'll just give you sort of what's what you've seen in the, um, even in the ordinary differential equation course, when somebody gives you an equation and gives you a solution and says check that that's, that solution satisfies that equation. Okay. Um, it's not really solving the equation, but again, due to limitation of time, um, that's probably the, the easiest way to do it. So, turns out that uh, one can check, whoops, that the following is actually a solution. So, it's 1 over square root of 2 pi d times t e to the minus x squared over 2 dt is a solution of the diffusion equation. Okay, and how do you check this? You just differentiate, right? Now, you see when you differentiate with respect to T, it's already a product here, so you have to do a little bit of work. It's not. It's not just here. Look at it, and you see. Yeah, that's. Also, when it's with respect to x, you have to differentiate twice. So the first time you differentiate, you're going to give x times some exponential. So the second time you differentiate again, is going to be a product. Okay. But you must do this. If you've, if you've never done this, you must do it. Um, okay. Just to verify that this is a solution. So simply just show that, you know, that derivative with respect to t is equal to the second derivative with respect to x with that extra, that uh, constant in front, d over 2. Okay? Now, there is, 
the fundamental fact about this uh, this solution is that if you uh, if you look for other solutions, you won't find other solutions of this equation. Again, assuming you're looking on the whole line. So, so this is actually pretty much the only solution of this equation, except a constant multiple of this. So any solution, well, I shouldn't say that, any solution, but um, all the solutions can be kind of referred back to, so more general, we will talk about this constant multiple of this solution as being the fundamental solution of this equation. Okay, and let me tell you why. So, so if you are to to um, well, obviously t cannot be zero, so t has to be positive, so you can divide by t and also take the square root. So, but if t is very close to zero, so very close to zero, um, this graph is simply the graph, the uh, the bell-shaped curve, right, in x with respect to x, and. At, at x equals 0, what is uh, the height? e to the 0 is 1, right? So the height, the, the concentration in the middle is p naught over the square root, right? And so if t is very small, that's going to be very large, right? So it's going to be something like this. So. so it's going it's to be very concentrated at x equals 0. And again, this is this goes this this goes to infinity as square as one over square root of t. As t is large, gets larger and larger. So maybe the next t is let's say of the order of one. Then it's going to look like a Gaussian. Yeah. Um, and again, it's going to have a peak that, of course, is going to depend on this p naught. Okay. So the peak is going to be p naught over square root of two pi square root of dt. And uh, if t is large, what's going to happen? It's going to be very very small. The peak is going to be very small, but it's going to be very, like, kind of very wide here, right? So, in fact, so so, what's a better, what's the best way to, to talk about this um, width, basically the standard deviation, right? Or the yeah, the standard deviation. So the width of this um, bulk of the of the of the pollutant or of chemical would be what? Well, if we consider this to be, well, this is Gaussian, we can think about the standard deviation as one standard deviation or two standard deviations from the mean, right? So what's going to be the standard deviation here? DT, right? Because remember it was x squared over 2 sigma. Uh, 2 sigma squared, right? So, so sigma squared is dt. Okay? So you see that sigma is actually, as, as we said earlier, the standard deviation is uh, grows like square root of, of, d, of t. Yeah, the variance is dt. So the variance is Linear in t is linear in t, and uh, the, the standard deviation is squared. So, so this is, the bulk of this uh, material is going to expand, right, or spread by 
not at a, at a linear rate, but at as a square root of t rate. Of course, this all assumes d, d is constant. It's a constant uh, diffusivity in the medium. Okay, so. So let's see. So the, the, the example is that, that's uh, mentioned in the book is, is of a, uh, I think, chemical accident. So like airborne pollutant. So this is an example. Pollutant. Uh, following a, following a, uh, an accident at a chemical plant, right? So it says initially you have some sort of a high concentration of of this pollutant that you kind of care about at location. This is where the plant is, right? And it's just, you know, it's like a concentrated... Um, it's concentrated around this, this uh, location. And then subsequently what happens is you have some, <coughs> so I should, I should say the concentration, if you were to plot it, would be kind of here, right? But subsequently uh, you have, you notice this plume as being somewhere, somewhere away from this somewhat dispersed, and here's like a, a, a town or a city, okay? And you are kind of warned, uh, you kind of are um, wondering of what, what this uh, pollutant is going to do as time evolves. Uh, is it going to affect this town or not, okay? So the, what's, what's known is that after, an hour after release, a toxic cloud that's 2,000 meters long Okay, so it's somewhere. Oh, okay. So, so after an hour, this uh, is two kilometers long plume and the maximum concentration of pollutant in the cloud is 20 times the safe level. So the maximum concentration is 20 times the safe level. Question is, what is the maximum concentration expected in town? How long will it take until the concentration falls back below the safe levels? Okay, so so what happens here is that there is some drift. Okay, some drift, some wind. Which, in absence of the wind, you would have the, just the concentration be always centered at, at the at where the power plant is and just diffuse on both both sides, right? But there is some some. Uh, so the wind speed is given by, so wind speed is given to be 3 kilometers per hour, which is very small actually, right? Okay, so how do you model this? So how do you, again, this very simple assumptions, um, To make is that let's see do we have we should have the distance from the plant to the um, yeah 10 kilometers upwind okay so we have this distance to be 10 kilometers here from the plant to the town right so we'd like to know how this plume evolves and what, what, how will it be felt in town, right? Is it going to be above the safe level or below the safe level? One is going to be um, 
maximum, and so forth. So, so the model is going to say the following. So, so it turns out that in the presence of wind, the PDE, and again, we're not going to actually talk about derivation of this, but. If there's no wind, this term doesn't show up, right? There's no, there's no, um, there's not no term like that. But in presence of wind, uh, this term is added to the, you know, to that um, model, to that derivation, and the outcome of this is the following: it's 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 saying that the solution is of the following form. And again, one can one can see this through the um, through various, you know, one can, just by direct computation, if you want, um, is the following. So it says that it's uh, one over or p naught, excuse me, over square root of two pi d t e to the minus, and this is x minus v t squared over two d t. So the only effect of this drift is that there's a shift in the peak, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the location of the peak. Okay? You can actually check this if you um, if you want. You can check that when you take the derivatives, well, or you can make a change of variables uh, to see that this term shows up. So with this term in, you have an equality okay, of the derivatives. I think change of variable is the easiest. Uh, so so the solution really looks as as we said. It looks it starts very concentrated. Right? Then it kind of drifts. So, so then, so it starts uh, at, if you want to time zero, at location zero, but then it kind of starts diffusing and drifting, right? So this guy is going to be, oops, this should be higher here. But the peak is actually moving, right? So this is the peak location. So the peak location moves with with speed v, basically. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. So how do you actually um, plug in the numbers here? So. Okay, so to say that at time t1, your concentration is peak concentration is 20 times the um, about the um, safe level, right? Amounts to say the following. So you just say that C of zero and one. So at time one, this is time, time one, and um, okay. So this zero is kind of relative, but. It's just to say that the concentration is 20, and this equals, according to that formula,
maybe I should say this is uh, not at zero at one, but so at time one, you see already your your peak is at location v. So maybe this is should be v. Okay, this is twenty. This is p naught divided by square root of two pi d times one. Okay, and this is e to the minus v minus v times one. So this is zero basically e to the zero over two d t or d times one. So this is just one. At time one, the position is is a velocity. Yeah. Or another way to, to say it is, you, you can count the, um, you can you can um, take the reference. So if I, this is at time one, you can take the reference to be to x zero. It could be it should be the one where the the peak concentration is. Okay. But if you if you if you take x to be zero where the plant is, then it's just a shift here. So I think maybe it's, it's best to leave it where the plant is. X is zero. And at time one, this is going to be x equals v, right? And in general, x is going to be v times t. Okay. Anyway, so this is zero. So this just tells you that what uh, this p naught is. So by the way, the the reason for this, so you need this information to figure out what um, what that constant is, because that constant is not is not you know, uh, is pretty much arbitrary unless you, you have this extra information. So 20 times. Okay. So you see this this constant still depends on the on the D on that diffusivity. Diffusivity is gonna come out of the width of the plume. Yeah, go ahead. Right, but this, okay. So the safe level is whatever the safe level is, right? You can normalize. You can actually always refer to that as being. So it's a, it's always relative to that. So it's, so your your safe level is assumed to be one, for instance. Yeah, you're right. It should be a constant, and then the, then you would carry that constant all the way through. So the assumption is that it's always concentration relative to that level. Yeah. Okay, so now what is D? Well, D comes from the width of the plume at time one, which is given to be two kilometers, right? Two kilo, two. Okay, it's two kilometers, um, and the assumption is that the width is actually um, four standard deviations. So why is that? Because within four standard deviations from the mean, from the mean, so if you are two standard deviations to the left or right of the mean, then you have 95 percent of the material. Okay, it's within that. So that's the bulk bulk of the of the plume basically. Now remember, in, in reality, it's, the plume doesn't look just like a bell shaped. Okay, so so it's this is just a very uh, crude approximation. But um, if you if you're using this model, the point is that if you're using this model, um, this is a reasonable assumption to make. So it's four standard deviations. That is, the standard deviation is one fourth, right? So if the width is for sigma, then sigma has to be 0.5 kilometers. So what's the variance? Or what's going to be d, basically? Uh, at time 1, it's going to be d times t, right? The very variance is d times t, remember that? The variance is the square root, or the square, the square of, the, of the, excuse me, the square of the standard deviation is d times t in this model again. And this is just 0 0.25. Okay? 
So this is the D, and that's what you can find the P0 to be from the previous one. So P0 was 20 times, okay, 20 times. Now remember, never, never rush to plug in the numbers if you don't have to. So, but but you you can do it, right? So if you need P naught. Okay. So why? Do, uh, oh. Okay. So it turns out this is uh, like close to eight. If you're, if you want to have kind of a rough idea of what P naught is. Okay. So. All right. So what is the so so now you can go back and say well now I know precisely what the concentration is at all times and at all locations right is going to be what is it going to be It's going to be this particular P naught. So this is. Can I write it as like eight? I shouldn't write it as eight. I should write it as. This is P naught divided by. The square root of. Two pi d t. E to the minus x minus v t. Squared over two d t. And the only thing that. Are floating in this formula are x and the t. Right. Everything else is 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 determined. Okay. So the last thing is to say that the concentration in the town uh, is when x is 10, and that's just a function of of time, and it's going to be what 20 over square root of t e to the minus. 10 minus 3t squared over 0.5, d was 0.25t. Okay? So if you are just, you're an observer at that location and you see the you see the so your 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 location is here, right? You see the wind. I mean, you see you see the thing coming at you, and you can see a small, very small concentration here, then an increasing concentration. As this plume kind of moves, it's going to move above you, but it's going to be at a much lower peak, right? Because as it moves, it kind of slows down, right? So that that. Peak is, is given by this for, that uh, that formula that uh, excuse me that uh, concentration at the location where you are. It follows this. You can plot it and see, right? So you can see the maximum and so forth. Um, so uh, let's see. So what is the um, yeah? So you can maximize it. So now you can answer all the questions like maximum. Uh, concentration is going to be P max, which turns out to be what is it? 10.97 at T max, which is about 3.3, and that's in um, hours. Hours. So after 3.3 hours you'll see the peak concentration. And it's going to be, this is this means 3.3 minutes above 1, so it means it's, no, I'm sorry, 10. 10.97 is means it's going to be 10 times the safe level, right? Now, what's the, the answer to that question? Like, after how much time is going to go back to the safe levels? Have to set this equal to 1. And solve for what? How many t's are you going to get? Two of them, right? Which one is going to pick? They're both going to be positive. The later value, right? Because the first value of t is going to be where 
you're first hit by this wave, right? You see when it's going to take a little bit of time, and then you're going to right. Initially, there's there's you're a safe level, right? But then you, the first time is going to be uh, the concentration equal to one is going to be the the start of the of the pollutant period, and then the later value is going to when it's going to be back to safe. Okay, simple model, right? It's a very simple model, but it's still not obvious. Okay, it's it's not so. The outcome of this is going to be something that you can I don't know, go and tell somebody that cares about this, right? That has no idea about math. Okay. Um, so it falls within that kind of modeling pr process that we've been talking about. Um, and the book also talks a little bit about um, sensitivity. Lots of, lots of assumptions here, right? One of the assumptions is certainly the speed of the wind. It's never constant, but even if it's constant, you may not know it, like you can make an, an approximation. Um, so you can see this, there's a table of, of values for different uh, wind speeds, different high concentrations, the time until safe levels, right, and so forth. Yeah? So the concentration of mass formula, is that the same for diffusion and fluids? change? Diffusion and fluids. You mean, uh, well, in different medium, you mean? Yeah, different mediums. Um, the the, the constant is going to change for sure, the diffusivity. Yeah. Um, now, you also can have what's called anomalous diffusion. If you do have not normal diffusion, then that's, that's what normal diffusion is. Okay. Now, if you do an experiment and, and you're able to measure something that contradicts this model. Then you have to go back and say, I'm going to change my assumptions. One assumption is this, that things are, going, are, are following normal diffusion. So there is, that's what's called a anomalous diffusion. It's just kind of a it's just kind of a revisit or it's a it's a change in the assumption. The assumption is that you, these are not just uh, particles of pollen in in the air, right? It's not springtime. It's actually a bad thing happening. So, right? It's an oil spill. I mean, for oil, certainly this is not normal diffusion. Why is it not normal diffusion? Well, oil particles don't mix with with, with water, so they always try to, try to stick together, right? So in fact, I don't even think it's it's say it's uh, appropriate to call it diffusion. It's more like dispersion, right? It's, it disperses, right? It stays together. It's like a organism, but it just kind of spreads according to the wa uh, wave patterns, wind patterns, current patterns. Patterns. Uh, the the volcano ash is more like diffusion, right? But it may not be normal diffusion. That is, as that plume spreads, let's say there's no wind. The standard deviation may not go like square root of t. So, anomalous diffusion is when when this um, uh, standard deviation is not like t to the one half, but t to some power, or alpha is not one half. Okay, and this actually has been uh, observed in lots and lots of physical things. Like for instance. Um, so the author of this book, he's been at the University of, ne of, of uh, Nevada, Reno. So they were doing water um, in porous media. So you have you know water in uh, underground, right? That's that's diffusion, but it's certainly not normal diffusion, right? So there are some anomalous type of diffusions, um, and it's a kind of an interesting thing. I mean, interesting thing is that. To model such things, you end up with um, with um, equations that look like this, and um, maybe I shouldn't scare you too much. 
But um, I don't know. This is where, where it's not the same alpha as this. Maybe maybe I should call this beta. It's where where you have fractional order derivatives. So do you know what the half derivative of of x is? Okay. So it's a whole new field. It's called fractional calculus. Um, <laughs> That's what it is. It's it's messy. It's it's like a, so so again. I think um, it's it's actually a current um, area of research: fractional order uh, partial differential equations, or you know probabilistic, you know anom anomalous diffusion processes. Um, so you know. So there's there's uh, that that kind of thing. So assume normal unless uh, unless demonstrated otherwise. Well, as always, you assume the simplest first. If you can get away with that and get the big bucks, you know. But but if if you if if you're seeing some, I mean, if your model is going to be, you know, it may be valid for a day or two, and then. Right, so if it depends on the scope of the model, it's of the modeling process, right? So, um, so all of this have to be adjusted. There's always re readjustments and reconsiderations of the assumptions. Um, but again, you know, all we do here is is just that. Um, the only sensitivity that uh, one does is to some of the parameters in this model, but the model is the same, right? So the parameters are. Um, What's the wind speed? Wind speed. Uh, what else could it be? I don't know. Uh, I think that's pretty much. Velocity of the, of the medium. Yes, if you're in water, so the D. The D. So certainly D. Yes. Um, yeah. So. Okay. So actually, uh, the the author even says talks about this anomalous diffusion. Um, the, there is there is extremely important work, especially in the West here, because of the water shortage. Uh, this anomalous diffusion is is huge. There's a there's a group at Colorado School of Mines that does a lot of this uh, research, not in math but in ge geosciences. You know. Okay. Um, Anyway, I, I thought it was kind of interesting uh, that two things uh, happened recently that uh, have something to do with this. It's all about how that thing spreads, you know, and, and affects, you know, is it going to affect this airport, or is it going to affect this coastline, or is it going to affect... And um, you, you can see how, uh, how much more complicated things are because of... This was boring, but... Um, but this is not boring, right? Things are, are evolving in time, patterns change. Who knows? The next volcano is going to erupt. I need to go to Romania fairly soon, so keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> but anyway, um, any questions? This. So we're going to have to leave mark of change for next week. Um, chapter 8. Yeah. Are we supposed to be 16? You certainly should do 16, and then uh, the other two prob uh, three, I think, maybe we'll um, make it two only from the mark of change um, for the last homework. But certainly number 16 is very close related to what we what we talked about. So, okay. Say it again. It's posted already, but I, I I'll just delete probably. We'll see how much we do Monday. Okay. So, but I would say do this for Monday. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I need to um, somebody to administer this. Can somebody turn it? Okay. Um, so these are the FCQs. <coughs> All right. <coughs>